So we'd like to turn your Bibles then to Colossians. That's where we're going to be reading this morning. Colossians chapter 1. Good morning. Uh, the reading today comes from the letter to the Colossians. And I'll be reading from chapter 1, verse 1 through to verse 14. And that's Colossians, starting with chapter 1, verse 1, and reading through to verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ in your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Shall we pray then as we look at this together? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Father, as we've already sung, that we would um, have reverence and awe that you have spoken to us, and that we would uh, treasure what you said to us, and that we would listen carefully as you urge us to, to listen carefully to the word of your Son. So bless us, Father, we pray. Father, we pray that you'd um, make my words clear and faithful. And Father, may all of our hearts be drawn up uh, to the great gospel of the Lord Jesus, his great work, his great person there in heaven at your right hand. And Father, may we be drawn to greater love for him, uh, greater valuing of him in our lives, and to live for him, to live for Christ alone. Father, please progress that amongst your people today, and even be pleased to add to your people those who are not yet born again from above. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're starting a new series this morning in the letter to the Colossians, this letter of Paul to the church in Colossae. Now, this letter could be described as a lockdown letter, if you like. Uh, Paul is in prison here. You can see that from chapter 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And you can see the very last verse of the whole letter says that he's in chains. Remember my chains, he says. So if our lockdown's difficult, well, Paul's was more so. He was literally locked down in chains. But now just think of the 13 letters of Paul. If you know your Bibles um, at all, think of the 13 letters of Paul. And each of these letters from Romans to Philemon in the New Testament, each of these letters have, it has its own distinctive flavor about it all written by the same person, all equally inspired by God, and yet they've got their own characteristics and flavour about them. 
Now, just as you scan through in your head, are there particular letters that you find a deeper, more radiant sense of joy in them? I think I probably do if, if I think about it. Joy in the goodness of the gospel, um, a particularly deep sense of the glory of Christ comes out in some letters more than others, I think. And the striking thing, I think, is that it's those letters that Paul wrote from prison that have the deepest sense of joy and of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in them. Those letters include Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians that we looked at last week. Uh, there's also Philemon, the last letter uh, in, in the New Testament, and uh, the other prison letter is 2 Timothy. But particularly in uh, Philippians, Colossians and Ephesians, we have a, a radiant sense um, uh, of, of joy and the glory of, of Christ in them. They were all penned from prison. Now, I don't want to over-egg this point at all. There are purple patches elsewhere in Paul's letters. Think of Galatians 2 verse 20, which we've looked at in the last week or two. Um, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's a delightful verse in Galatians, which is, Galatians, which is not a, a prison letter. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That whole chapter of Romans um, has got all sorts of great things in. So I don't want to over-egg this point. But are not the the highest peaks, um, at least to be found in the prison letters, as much as elsewhere, which itself is striking. And I think we find them in, in, in a longer duration. So we've got next week coming up, well, if I do it next week, um, chapter 15. Uh, sorry, verse 15 of, of, of Colossians 1. We've got verse 15. We've got this um, extended meditation on the glory of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, we've got again an extended meditation on, on Christ in his state of humiliation and his state of exaltation. Um, coming up in Colossians 3, we've got this, uh, Christ is, is, is in heaven and our life is hidden with him. So at least as much as in the other letters of Paul do we find these purple patches in these prison letters, and maybe we find them at slightly greater length. In these letters. My point is this. Trying circumstances are not a hindrance to joy in Christ. In fact, they can be an instrument to deeper joy in him. Now, many Christians can testify to this, and I've seen it radiantly in some of you at South Street, that some of your dreadful things that you've been through, uh, you emerge from that at the end with a, a radiant love of Christ. That wasn't quite like that before you went through those things. Well, however we're feeling about our circumstances, my prayer is that through Colossians, through this letter, God would open our eyes more to the glories and majesty and preciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the theme that this letter sings with, certainly from verse 15 onwards, but elsewhere in the letter too, throughout the letter. And so may we, as we go through this letter, know Christ more gloriously, more tenderly, more captivatingly. So let's look at the specifics of this letter then. The Colossian church was not planted by Paul, but by Epaphras. This figure Epaphras occurs in verse 7 of chapter 1. And there we find out that they learned it. They learned the gospel from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, says Paul. Now, geography. Um, uh, Colossi is in Asia Minor, so think modern-day Turkey. If you're not quite sure where that is, uh, think of the Mediterranean basically as, as a, 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 a wide rectangle towards the eastern end, uh, the right-hand end of that rectangle. Uh, you, well, right at the end, you've got Israel. Uh, but on the north of that eastern end, uh, you've got Turkey. And, and if you go to the uh, southwest of Turkey, inland a bit, uh, 100 miles or so, maybe less, uh, you get to Colossae. That's where it is. Uh, it's in what was called Asia Minor in ancient times. And we find out it, that from uh, um, that this letter that Epaphras was from Colossae in chapter 4, verse 12. Paul says he's one of you. So he's a native of that city. 
And somehow he'd heard the gospel and been converted. Now, this possibly took place while Paul was in Asia Minor in, um, in Ephesus. Paul spent two years, we find in um, Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Uh, Paul spent two years in Ephesus teaching there daily. And, and it says in Acts chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, sorry, Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul was reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So we get the idea that people from beyond Ephesus came to the city, uh, heard Paul during those two years he was teaching there in that hall of Tyrannus. And very likely, very possibly at least, Epaphras came the hundred miles or so from Colossae, also in Asia, that, that province of Asia, to Ephesus, heard Paul was converted. Seeing as, Paul, uh, seeing as Luke in, in Acts chapter, um, chapter 19 talks about the fact that all Asia heard, well certainly people from Colossae then uh, could have heard. Anyway, somehow Epaphras was converted and he returned to Colossae and preached the good news there. And it seems from our passage that Epaphras has travelled to see Paul. Verse 8 seems to indicate that he's with Paul. Uh, he, um, he's made known to us your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras has travelled. He's with Paul. He's telling Paul about the church in Colossae and how they're flourishing. And so, the, and so Paul begins this letter, uh, verse 2, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. At Colossae, and he begins the main body of this letter from verse 3 onwards, thanking God for their faith and love, the faith and love of these believers in Colossae. Believers he hadn't seen face to face, very likely. But believers that were, um, well, that church that had been planted there by Epaphras. So we have a flourishing Christian church, which the Apostle Paul has not been directly involved in planting himself. And what we have in our passage are, in verses 3 to 8, Paul's thanksgiving for them. And in verses 9 to 14, Paul's prayers for them. Now, I said in my introduction that Christ Jesus is the great theme of the letter to the Colossians. Now, it's easy to see that in the passage that's coming up next time, verses 15 onwards. But what about our passage? Is it true of our passage as well? Well, I want us to see that Christ is indeed the great theme of our passage as well. It would be easy to take a bits and pieces approach to this passage and to, to, to lose the, the whole picture that it depicts for us um, by, by going through the bits and pieces. We need to make sure we don't miss the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the beginning, the middle and the end of our passage. See how it, see how it opens in verse 3? We thank God, well this is the, the opening of the main body once you've got past the formalities uh, of the greetings in verses 1 and 2, verse 3 starts, we thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. There's Christ there. And see the climax that our passage draws to in verses 12 to 14, where Paul talks about, uh, uh, urges the Colossians to give thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Echoes of what we thought about earlier. The kingdom of God's beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Christ is the beloved son of the Father. And this is the theme that sings in Paul's heart as he thinks about the church in Colossae. Paul doesn't congratulate the church in Colossae for being a faithful church. Rather, he thanks God for them. Do you see that? Verse 3. And he doesn't just thank God, some generic, bland God, but he thanks specifically the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who saved them through his Son and brought them into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Well, I said that Lord Jesus was there in our passage at the beginning, middle and end. We've seen it, him at the beginning, verse 3. You've seen him at the end in verses 12 to 14. What about in the middle? Where is he in the middle? Well, verse 6. Look at verse 6. See how verse 6 talks about the fact that it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. What is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world? End of verse 5. The gospel is. The gospel. The gospel is God's great 
plan of salvation conceived before the foundation of the world and carried out in the history of the world through the sending of his son into the world. It's all centered on his son, his life, uh, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the work he continues to do in his heavenly glory is coming again to bring the world to come. And what it says here is that the gospel, this gospel brought about through the Son of God, is bearing fruit and growing across the whole world. It's doing that because the Lord Jesus is on the throne, pouring out his spirit. And where the spirit is poured out, there is new life springing up. Now, remember, we thought a few weeks ago about, well, from the end of um, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 24, verses 45 to 47. We thought there about how Jesus talks about it is written that the, that the Son of Man, he must suffer and, and, uh, and die and then be glorified. And that glorification includes not just his resurrection, not just his ascended glory in heaven, but the work that he does there. The work of bringing people to himself, drawing people to himself. So we saw from Isaiah 52 verse 10 that all the ends of the earth will see the salvation provided by God. How will they see that? It says, the Lord Jesus sends out his spirit, sends out his word to be preached, and people are gathered to him in faith and repentance. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16 uh, talks about there that's uh, the mystery of godliness. It talks about the fact that he, he the Lord Jesus, um, appeared in the flesh. Uh, he was vindicated by the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached on among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. And part of the taking up in glory of him is that he is preached on in, in among the nations and believed on in the world. And so as Paul hears the news of what's going on in Colossae, he hears it not just as a club going on there that is thriving, not just as a special interest group that's doing well. He hears it in the context of the majestic gospel plan of God being unfurled and brought about through his son crucified and glorified and sending his spirit through the preaching of his word. Paul sees the spirit at work, end of verse 8. He sees the kingdom of his beloved son prospering on earth, end of verse 13. Paul see it, sees it all as a micro instance of the flourishing, that the worldwide fruition of the great gospel plan of God to bring about the rescue of people from darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son through the work of his son. Now, do you see how Paul in our passage is lifting the Colossians believers eyes up to see who they are? To see the glorious work of the Father, Son and Spirit in them. And not just in them, just small little them in their city, but that as part of God's great worldwide work of saving people and bringing people into the kingdom of his Son. Let's, think, let's apply this to ourselves. Who are we? Who, who are we at South Street Free Church? How do we see ourselves? Just maybe a small, weak, feeble bunch of people struggling. What does the Apostle Paul say to us across the centuries? Or even more to the point, what does the Holy Spirit say to us from heaven? Open your eyes. See the majestic work of God that you at South Street are part of. Yes, we're small. Yes, we don't see much in the way of growth. Yes, there are grey hairs aplenty and missing generations. But Jesus Christ is on his throne, reigning and building his church and causing his work to bear fruit across the world. And we are part of that. We're one instance of that. In John chapter 12, on the eve of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, Jesus says this. It's worth turning there. John chapter 12. Verses 23 and 24. So Jesus says this on the eve of his suffering and death. The hour has come 
for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So the time had come for Jesus to be glorified. And how was he to be glorified? By dying. How was that going to be to his glory? Because this dying was going to be like a seed falling to the ground. And when a seed falls to the ground, it bears much fruit. Much good comes from it. Now, what prompts Jesus to say that? Verse 21 and 20, well, 20 and 21. It's Greeks. People like the people in our passage. These Colossians were Greeks. Greeks coming to see Jesus and asking to see Jesus. And that, as it were, sets off a trigger in Jesus' mind. That now is the time for him to be glorified. The Greeks are seeking him. Now is the time for him to give his life, to bear fruit that's going to be across the whole world. It's going to be for Jews and Greeks and British and all sorts, all nations. Verses just instead in John, um, John 12, verses 32 and 33, talk about the, Jesus there talks about the fact that he's going to be lifted up to die. And by that, he's going to draw all to himself. What does he mean by all? Well, in context of John, it's all that the Father's given him. Will be drawn to him for eternal life. Every church manifesting the new life of repentance from sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is fruit springing directly from Jesus giving his life. Wherever there are Christians who hate sin, hate, this, hate their own sin, and who love Jesus and who flee to Jesus and who cling on to him for salvation, there is found Jesus' work, the fruit of him giving his life. Now let's just think of this in the context of what's going on at the moment with all this, these riots um, about the death, the killing of George Floyd. There's lots of racial unease at the moment, lots of racial tensions. The killing of George Floyd is rightly to be condemned. Racism, especially institutional racism, is abhorrent. And do you see how our passage and what we're thinking about from John 12 as well addresses that? Christ's work of salvation will bear fruit, verse 6 in our passage, in the whole world. What do we find out from Revelation? Remember we looked at, we've been going through the first part of Revelation just before lockdown. People from every nation and tribe and tongue and race are being saved. There are no races above others. There are no races below others. People of every race were brought into sin and death by our common ancestor, Adam. And people from every race and nation and language are being brought into the kingdom of God's beloved Son by the work of that same Son of God, Jesus. All alike are under God's condemnation. And all alike who come to Christ are freed, forgiven, and brought into full membership of God's family. There are no first-class citizens, no second-class citizens. We are all on a level playing field. Jew, Gentile, all the races, all the nationalities. There's a song we sing that has the, the, the two lines, Christ will have the prize for which he died an inheritance of nations. So wherever there's a congregation of people who love the Lord Jesus and have fled to him from sin to be saved, then that is a beautiful thing. Whether they're black or white or any skin colour, whether they're Far Eastern, Middle Eastern, Western, whether they're from a tribe that's four foot tall or from a tribe that's seven foot tall or from anything between, it is all the glorious fruit of the Son of God dying to save them and bring them into his kingdom. Without Christ, all people alike are equally lost. 
in the domain of darkness, the domain of sin and death. But in Christ, all people alike are equally lifted to the heights of his glory. Transferred from the kingdom, uh, from the domain of darkness, it says in our passage, from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. So wherever such reborn, redeemed lives are found, there is the beautiful work of Jesus Christ. And so joyful thanks for any gathering, any, any people who have been transformed by the Spirit of God. Joyful thanks and praise to God are due for that. Now, in the final few minutes, I want to just move on to looking at a couple of specific things that Paul says. So back to Colossians chapter 1 now. Now let's move on to a couple of specific things from Paul's prayer. Let me look at verses 9 and 10. And so, says Paul, from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Excuse me. Now see that how exactly the same phrase that was used in verse 10, as we've been considering, this phrase about bearing fruit and growing, it's there in verse, uh, it's there in verse 6 as well. Uh, sorry, it's considered from verse 6, it's there in verse 10 as well. Uh, it's like different translated in the ESV. Um, in one it's growing, in the other it's increasing. It's the same word in Greek. The two things, bearing fruit and growing or increasing. So the bearing fruit of the gospel happens both on a large scale, verse 6, in all the world, and within the individual believer, verse 10. So verse 6 is the big picture. The bird's eye view, verse 10, is the close-up of the same thing. The seed of Christ's death bears fruit in transformed lives. Lives of good deeds that are pleasing to God. Lives of love and kindness and serving others and putting self last and others first. Lives of holiness and righteousness. There's a way to live our lives or to walk, as verse 10 puts it, there's a way to walk uh, our life that is worthy of the Lord. And there is a way, by implication, to live our lives that is not worthy of the Lord. The fruit of the gospel is the former and not the latter. There's a way to live our lives that's pleasing to the Lord. Therefore, there's a way that's not pleasing to the Lord. And the fruit of Christ's work is death and resurrection, is the former, not the latter. Now, some of you are not as persuaded about this as you need to be. Some of you think that having a good lifestyle, a lifestyle of righteousness and holiness and kindness and serving others and living to please the Lord, doesn't really matter. You might think some people might be into that sort of thing, but you don't need to be. This is badly wrong. In John chapter 15, Jesus uses there the picture of a vine and of God the Father as the vine grower, the, the vine dresser is the old term, the one who's tending the vine. And therefore, he's also looking for the fruit from the vine. God is looking for fruit from his people. Branches that's people, you and me, branches that don't bear fruit, God throws in the fire to be burnt, John 15, verse 6. If we're truly in Christ, we will bear fruit, fruit in our lives, the, fruits of, the fruit of lives that are pleasing to him, lived worthily for the Lord. And it's by bearing that fruit in our lives that we prove ourselves, we show ourselves to be Jesus' disciples, John 15, verse 8. If you're concerned only to live to please yourself, then you need to wake up. This is not the mindset of a person who can be assured that they are safe in the salvation that Jesus gives. 
If Paul prays for the Colossians to walk worthily of the Lord, to bear fruit in every good work, to live lives that are fully pleasing to God, if he does that when he's already thanked God for their faith in Christ and their, their love for one another, then surely seeking to live for Christ is not an optional extra. It's something that each of us needs to be growing in. The, gross, the gospel doesn't give uh, bear fruit that is static, that it is, is done once and that's it. The gospel bears fruit that continues to grow, that continues to bear fruit in us. That's what the work of Christ on the cross does in our lives, in the lives of all who truly belong to him. We're, we're to be increasing in lives that are pleasing to God and lived worthily for the Lord. Increasing in the good works that God is looking for from us. Now this has to begin with God's spirit in us. That's why verse 9 of 1 Colossians talks, uh, uses the word spiritual. The spirit gives a person a new heart. A heart with what is pleasing to God written into it. That's what the new covenant promises are in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. The Spirit gives a person a heart that wants to please God. The Spirit gives a person a heart that is tender to what God loves and is revulsed by what God hates. The Spirit gives a person a heart that sees the domain of darkness for what it is. Darkness, sin. The Spirit gives a person a heart that longs for being established securely in the kingdom of God's Son. If you do not have a heart like this, then I urge you to seek it from God. Seek the forgiveness that it talks about at the end of our passage, the forgiveness of sins that comes through Jesus Christ alone. Seek the redemption that Jesus paid for with his own life. Seek to be established in the kingdom of God's beloved Son with the marks of that, the marks of a new heart that loves to please God, loves to live their life, not for themselves, but for the Lord who's given his life for them. Colossians is all about the preciousness of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus cannot be precious to anyone whose heart is indifferent to sin. So may God, as we go through the book of Colossians, this letter, May God, by his spirit, bring to birth in us, or fan into brighter flame, two things. First, a deep, all-consuming love for his son, as he loves him, as the Father loves him. And secondly, a true longing to walk in a way that is pleasing to God, that is worthy of the Lord who died for us, and that's bearing fruit in every good work. May God produce that in you and me in increasing measure as we go through this letter to the Colossians. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your beloved Son. Thank you for your work of transferring people from the domain of darkness into that kingdom of your son through the work of Christ on the cross. Thank you that his death on the cross is the sowing of a seed that bears much fruit across the world. Father, thank you for every sign of that fruit in our own lives, for which praise and thanks are to go to you, not congratulations to ourselves. And Father, where that fruit is lacking in our lives, may we be honest about that with ourselves and seek that new heart, that new birth from you. Oh, Father, please may we each be growing in our love for your Son, our adoration of him, our, our, our desire to know him and to have our hearts completely captivated by him. May we also be growing in lives that are pleasing to you and bearing fruit in, in, in our attitudes and in deeds that are, 
are pleasing to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.